halfway through the semester when there's still time to correct the course. Yes, ma'am. Is it too much to ask that you post your answer? I don't have an answer. No, and, and I, it's a fair question. I don't write an answer to my exam because I know the question very well. Um, I know all the nooks and crannies that you probably wouldn't even notice. So it's actually unfair to my answer. But the AMOS answer should be pretty good. And I will go over it during the 30 minute session where you and they deviate also where you deviate my own understanding. I mean, a short answer is no, I won't. But uh, the AMOS answer will get you a long way. Yeah, I don't actually write answers to my own exams because I don't think it's fair. Like, Perfect answer. It's not a realistic representation way for the 30 minutes for an hour and a half. Okay. Anything else? Anything else you want? Okay. Uh, let's uh, Jim and checked in. See me after class. Um, we'll do a question to start off. And the question is similar to what I asked last class, but it's not exactly the same. Um, if you haven't noticed this by now, pay very close attention to the way I framed the question, because uh, with words like always and never, um, I'm making you take a position. Uh, and, and the reason why I do true-false is it forces you to pick a side and then argue the side. Uh, rather than equivalent A, B, C, B. So I think I like for the true false question. So this is your this is your question. People are already voting, I haven't even read it yet. Okay, good. When the government exercises its police power for land use, it will never have to provide just compensation. That's your question. When the government exercises its police power for land use, it will never have to provide just compensation, true or false? Give it another 10, 15 seconds. All right, five, five more seconds. Okay, where did I drop up last time? Can you remember? Are you next? Yeah. Okay, and I realize this is flickering. Everyone notice that? Yeah. yeah. I don't know why. Um, if it's bothering you, just look at that screen. But I, this is very. Anyone has epileptic thing? Just just look at that screen. Uh, <laughs> it's actually a legitimate issue. You know, there's like people on Twitter they'll try and screw people with epilepsy by sending them flashing images from the seizures. It's not a joke. So uh, if you have a thing, just look over there. Um, best we can. Not a deal. Um, Christine, what'd you put? Um, B. Okay. Why'd you put B? Why'd you put false? Never is too strong of a word. Oh, never. Someone's silly. You're catching on. Good. Why, well, why, but why is that not the case, though? Why is it when the when the government exercises police power, it may not be required to offer compensation? Uh, it's an if it's for like the general welfare. What is a police power? Let's start there. Well, how do we define police power? It gives the state power to regulate land use. Specifically, what can the state regulate oh, under health, police? Safety and welfare and well being. Right. So we define the police power as the government's ability to regulate the health, safety, welfare, and morals of the people. Right? That's what we define the police power. Um, but we studied last week in class that the police power runs into the takings clause. And when a land use amounts to a taking, the government must provide compensation. So our discussion today in last class and probably next class also is to figure out when a government action is under the police power, in which case no compensation is needed, or when a government action falls beyond the police power, it's a taking, and therefore compensation is required. Are you wearing a Christmas sweater? Is this 50 degrees? Yeah. <laughs> How many of you were cold this morning? Oh my god, it was 50 degrees! 57. <laughs> no, 57. Matt, what'd you put? True or false? I put B, false. Okay. Why'd you put false? Uh, I don't really have a specific answer other than never, like you said, never was too strong, and I know that the line between a takings, like a, a takings action and the police power action is blurred, so I figured there was some hypotheticals where they would have to provide compensation. I will put true. true. 
the results since we, I think we nailed this question. Look at that, we got it. Yeah, yeah, B's right. Good job, guys. Yeah, very good, very good. Only a couple of you who didn't want to raise your hands. Um, <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. So the, the answer is B, right? Um, but you have to understand that your answer, so you're, you're, you're 90-something percent of you correct, which is good. But you have to understand the reason why the answer is B. Um, there are going to be some exercises of the police power which look an awful lot like a taking, where you lose basically the entire value of your property and you still get nothing for it. And there's some cases where there's a zoning law which says, yeah, you can have this empty lot, but you can't build anything on it. You get zero compensation for that. So the difficulty of this class is not answering this sort of like, you know, very radical <coughs> false question, right? The difficulty lies in the cases on the border where you're losing a lot of value of your property, but it doesn't quite <coughs> cross the line to where compensation is going to be required. So everyone okay with that? Okay. Any questions so far? Uh, yes, sir. Can you use the Penn Central balancing test for that? Oh man, you're way to schedule. We didn't get to Penn Central yet. We'll get there in about two weeks, I promise. Yeah. Penn Central is a famous uh, Supreme Court case involving uh, Grand Central Station, it's a train station in New York City, and the developers wanted to build a high rise above the train station. And the question was, can the government say, you can't build up? Does that amount to a taking because they're basically removing their air rights, their, their right to build in the air? And it's a complicated case, and we'll get there in a couple weeks, I promise. Any other questions? All right, so let's start with the first case, the, um, the Pennsylvania Northwest Distributor case. So uh, did I, are you guys next, or David, who's your next? <coughs> what, was I going this way? Yeah. Okay, David, you're next. Okay. <laughs> David, what's amortization? Amortization. I was a little confused. Good. Because <laughs> Not what you thought it was, right? Well, uh, I thought it had to do, uh, the only definition was uh, like, you know, payments over time with interest. Where, where, what, what dictionary did you use for that? Well, I know, I just like looked up on Google. Oh, I, you, I, did, you use, did you use Wikipedia or no? Uh, no, I didn't use Wikipedia, Good. but then I, I, I kept looking and then uh, I realized it also, it, that's not the only definition. It's not the only definition, right? So what's the other definition, the one that's relevant for, for today's case? What does amortization mean? Like if I, for example, if I have a piece of property and it's not, not conforming, good. Uh, it would be rather than like you know you lose your property right now. It's like okay, you have so much time to uh, conform your very good. Use of the property. So did anyone actually look up in Black's Law Dictionary? None of you. Oh, you did. No, well, no, my Black's uh, it got ruined in the floods. My Black's Law Dictionary. <laughs> okay, well I'll, I'll, I'll let that one pass. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> Good. That's perfect. Perfect definition. <laughs> now that's good. That's good. Yes. So amortization in the context of zoning is not what you're thinking. It's not like oh you have a bank account and over years the interest compounds, right? That's generally what you think the word amortization means. That's not what it means here. In the context of zoning. Amortization refers to the time in which a property owner has to conform when a property use is not conforming. It's the time in which a property owner has to conform when a property use is non conforming. So I just gave you a definition with another word you probably don't know. Mark, what does non conforming mean in the context of zoning? It means when there's a restriction based around a certain area like we talked about last week with like U1, U2 stuff where single resident or single family, double family, if there's something that lies within that zoning area, it doesn't conform to what the purposes are for for it. Okay, very good. So if you're conforming to zoning laws, you're good, right? When you conform to zoning laws, you fit in with whatever the zoning laws require. The opposite of that is non-conforming, right? You do not conform with a land use. Now, one of the difficult concepts of conforming and non-conforming 
is what happens if your structure's there already, and then the rules are changed in the middle of the game, right? You're there, your business has been there for a number of years, and then out of the blue, the zoning board says, aha, we're gonna change this, right? So, Amy, if you haven't purchased a property yet, and the zoning laws are changed, and then you buy it, is there any surprises? There shouldn't be, because there's no due diligence. Right, because the laws were changed after. Now, Amy, let me ask you the other question. Let's say you buy your property, you haven't started building it yet, but you own it, and then the city makes a new zoning law. What's the problem there? Why, why is it problematic, the, the second scenario I gave you? Well, if you purchased it with the intention to build something specific, and then they change the laws, then you can't continue with your plan. Right, so the difficulty is this, right? You buy a piece of property, you announce you want to build something there, you apply for a permit, and then magically, right, the city zoning ordinance changes magically. And the exact thing that you wanted to do is now illegal. Now, that happens quite a lot. Um, there was one case when I was clerking that I'll never forget, it was actually from Pennsylvania, not too far from where this case arose, um, where you had a methadone clinic. Right? Everyone know a methadone clinic? It provides treatment for people with addiction, right? Uh, a group wanted to open up a methadone clinic somewhere in western Pennsylvania, a pretty small town. And um, the city council caught wind of this plan. And they said, no, 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 we don't want a methadone clinic in our town because we don't want all the drug addicts coming here. They already live there, but you know, we don't want them coming here to, to get, <laughs> that's the problem, they're already there. So <laughs> we don't want them coming here to get treatment, right? Um, so then they passed a law based on saying we ban the provision of a methadone clinics within city limits. Um, that was challenged in court, and the court ultimately ruled that that violates the Disabilities Act and other federal laws, so that didn't fly. Uh, they said, okay, fine. They passed a new ordinance that said, you cannot build a methadone clinic within, was it 500 feet of a um, school, church, playground, basically any place where children might frequent, right? But if you actually look at a map, and you draw a 500 foot radius around schools, playgrounds, churches, whatever, basically the entire town is covered by that, right? So the consequence of that is the only remaining place is industrial zones, like out by, you know, out in the boonies, there's no public transportation there, it's basically impossible to get to, uh, but that, that's generally what happened. So finally, this clinic succeeded. They found a spot in the outer banks of town, there was nothing nearby, and said, okay, we're gonna open up our zoning uh, board here, I'm sorry, methadone clinic here. So what happens, right? This is actually pretty crazy. There was a little strip of grass in front of the methadone clinic, right? The city, Brett, you're laughing, Bradley. What, what happens? Uh, green space. Green space, yeah. The city designates as a park this little strip of grass in front of the clinic. I'm, I'm telling you, it's it's basically the size like the first three rows of this room, right? It's a pretty small grass strip. They say, ah, that's our new city park. And they actually got challenged in court, and ultimately the court said, no, 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 you can't do that. But what I'm trying to convey is, when you have a city that doesn't want a certain um, business or whatever uh, home to open, um, they often resort to the zoning code in very uh, um, creative ways to try to deny construction. And, and the case we have here is actually quite similar, right? Uh, let's go back up top. John Paul, what were the facts here in the first case, this, the, the Pennsylvania Northwestern Distributor case? How would you value the property? Right, but what other reason why beyond property value may city not want this in their jurisdiction? 
Okay, there's this morality, right? But what else? Right? And Fidel, what are the reasons why the city might not want to have a, an adult bookstore in the city limits? <coughs> Yeah, no, definitely, they disagree with the content, no doubt about that, right? But what what are some of the safety concerns that may arise in these sorts of places in the city limits? Secondary effects. Even if the adult bookstore by itself isn't bad, it attracts bad stuff. And if you know what I'm talking about, if you drive down Richmond Avenue at like two in the morning on Saturday, <laughs> everyone knows exactly what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> people are not. If you don't, just Google it. Um, there are certain people, unsavory, beautiful word, beautiful word, uh, who frequent these sorts of establishments, and they may bring crime, drugs, alcohol, prostitution. You know, go down the list. So the city, um, traditionally, can say, look, under our police power, uh, we don't want the construction of various places that, like magnets, right? They bring in all the dirt from other neighborhoods and make our community dirty. In fact, uh, if you Google Moon Township, it's right by Pittsburgh International Airport. <coughs> I used to live nearby there. So this is right by the airport. Um, this is before the internet. So you can imagine people were doing when they're on the way to the airport. And, okay, I'll leave it at that. But, <laughs> in Jankovitz, where it is unusual. But, uh, <laughs> but the fact is, the state has the police power to regulate these sort of secondary effects of these establishments, right? So everyone get the basic gist, right? So Delilah, what does the city do after they learn that uh, this company wants to open up this, uh, this bookstore in, the, uh, in their city? Yeah, yeah, this is like, remember I said the method on an emergency meeting by the park, the grass strip? So what's, what's the emergency meeting here? Um, they wanted to put together a monetization clause. Good. Well, it's not just to move it. What do they have 90 days to do? Be very precise. What was the, what had to be done within 90 days? Be very, very precise here. Well, could they have a storage if they sell something else maybe? So what do they have to do with the 90 days? Be, be precise here. What did the zoning law actually say? What, forgetting the amortization, Delilah, what did the zoning law actually require to be done? Prohibit the operation of the adult business enterprise. Not just, Jillian, what, what exactly has to be done here? It wasn't just non-adult. What, what did they have to do? Um, yes, they had to be able to conform it, right? So here's what we have. The adult bookstore was non-conforming, right? I'll put these words on the board, right? You have conforming and you have non-conforming. The adult bookstore would have been non-conforming. So they had 90 days to become conforming, right? They had three months to bring their property into line with the ordinance, right? And how did they become conforming, Julian? What, what do they have to do to become conforming? What has to be done? Yeah, they have two choices, right? They could discontinue the adult business, maybe sell, I don't know, like Harry Potter books, something, right? something that's not obscene, or they could move their business to another location. Now, this was not much of a choice for them because first they had already paid for the land and they bought it with the understanding that they have their business there. And I suspect they had inventory, right? Merchandise, they took loans out, they maybe done some, uh, you know, some planning, hired an architect. <coughs> there are various things that they probably did to get their business ready to open. But now the city said, no, 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 because you're within 500 feet of a school, hospital, nursing home, park, church, establishment selling alcohol, that means a restaurant, right, or another adult enterprise. So basically, it was impossible for them to build 
this sort of adult bookstore anywhere in the town, and the place they already had was going to be eliminated. So, uh, uh, Avery, I'm sorry, Avery, uh, Avery, with a pre-existing use as a general matter, if you have a business, you're there legitimately, a new zoning law comes into effect. Are you required to comply with that new zoning law as a general matter? Forgetting that amortization for a minute. I think you need to be Yeah, that's the key point, right? If you have a pre existing use, that means you were there first, and the zoning law has been changed, you are not required to change yourself, right? Unless, Jesse, unless what happens, what might make you change your regime? What might make you change what you have if you have a pre existing use? So it's a nuisance abandonment or eminent domain, but it's kind of a balancing act uh, to determine what the government's imposition is against the uh, person's constitutional guarantee to enjoy land. You're exactly right, but what's the most common reason why someone might lose a pre existing use? Why they might use a pre existing use? I'm sorry, lose. Why they might lose a pre existing use? It's a very common reason why. Caitlin, let me ask you. They were conforming before? They were conforming before, but then they had, how did people lose it? They no longer conforming. Caitlin, let me ask you this question. Let's say you have a, um, a business, right? And you're, you're in an area that's zoned for residential, but your business was there first, right? Can they make you shut down your business? I don't think they can do that retroactively. Yes, that's right. Now, now let me ask you a second question, please. The question is this. What happens if your business has, let's say, one floor, and then you decide to build a second floor on top of your business, and you're in a, you're in a residential zone? Then what happens? Because that wouldn't be retroactive use to change your name. That's right. The way to screw up your non-conforming use is to change your property, right? If you make a material, uh, blah, if you make a material change to your property, you lose your non-conforming use, and Mazel Tov, you're now subject to the regulation, right? You are now subject to this uh, uh, new ordinance. So it creates a weird game, right? Where if you have a prior non-conforming use, you can't change your business at all. Because Caitlin's right, once you change your business, you lose your grandfather status, and you're now subject to the new rules. There was um, a one case, I think it was in Cincinnati, where you had a uh, a landfill or some sort of a, of, a, of a garbage sump in a residential area. And it was built like in the 19, like 20s before the zoning laws were in effect. And it's been there for like 80 <coughs> years. And the city keeps trying to litigate saying, aha, look, they changed this and they changed that. Get rid of their prior conforming use. And the court says, no, they haven't changed anything. They're still, they're still a landfill. It's the same business, no material changes. So you always have this sort of struggle. So I hand somewhere. Anthony? It's the same with residential properties, too, right? If you the have, same, if you yeah. Get your same home role. built close to the property line and they change it. If, if you were to remodel your home, you're now non conforming. So the, the rule is the change has to be material. And the word material is a word you use in law a lot. It's got to be, it's got to be a big change. Not like, you know. Not a wear and tear. If, like, maybe you paint your roof, right, or you, you, know, you re shingle your roof, that's probably not enough. But if you like, add another floor, or maybe add like a deck or a patio to your property that actually changes in a, in a big way, that that could run afoul of the uh, uh, rule. Yes, ma'am? What if you have a large lot and happen to be using it for a landfill and you just expanded it to the entire lot? That could be material change, right? Okay. Again, the key word there is material. How big is it? And that's, a, that's something for a court to right. balance. But um, if you have a, a pre-existing use, a non conforming pre-existing use, you go out of your way to keep it. <coughs> Because once you lose it, it's gone. The flip side, though, is that a prior non-conforming use runs with the land. So let's say I'm running that landfill, and my son inherits it, right? And his son inherits it then. Each inheritance keeps its non-conforming use. So there was an example, I think, in the notes in your book of a, of a restaurant in Brooklyn called Lundy's. You ever go to Lundy's by chance? I've been there. It's in Sheepshead Bay. It's a good restaurant. But it, it like had a... Is this humongous restaurant in Brooklyn right by the water, and it shut down in the 1970s, and it was boarded up for like 20 years. And then finally, like 20 years later, they, they opened it up again. And the question was, do they get to keep their non-conforming uses? And the court said, no, they don't. It was an abandonment, right? They abandoned the place for 20 years, 
the neighborhood changed, everything changed around it. So to keep your, um, your pre-existing use, you have to have continuous business and, and make sure you're using it, otherwise you lose it. And once you lose it, it's gone. Tyler. If you were in, uh, had a non-porn property and you knew that the city was going to try and get you in the way they could, okay. could you ask the courts to get a declaratory judgment? Exactly. Right. I mean, that's exactly what happens, right? So the zip, the, well, I don't want, so there's a doctrine in courts basically says that you can't go to federal court unless you first exhaust all your state court remedies. So you can't exactly seek a declaratory judgment first. You basically have to wait for the city to rule against you and then challenge it in trial court. Um, but you're, the general gist is saying uh, they tried to impose this um, uh, zoning restriction on me. They can't because I'm not performing prior use, therefore enjoying the enforcement of this uh, ordinance. So you, you, you can't go straight to federal court. That's actually a difficult problem. Uh, this case illustrates that you need to start off with the zoning board, appeal up to the city government, and only then can you file in the state trial court. And then you go up to the state court. But it, it's a very um, lengthy process, which is not designed to make you You can't just go to court and obtain a preliminary injunction barring the enforcement of zoning because it's more than that. Chester? Um, the previous one is, uh that you just told us about, uh -huh. um, if they made the change that was materialized and you said it would be subject to the ordinances, but if um, if it wasn't material, would they still be applying for the, the exceptions and heresies that you read about, or are like, you still going to apply? Oh, I should, okay, you're, you're bridging to the next topic, right? You're asking about the, the variances and the, the special exceptions? But, right, that was last the previous one. If, if you have a previous one used and you obtain a variant that doesn't get rid of your previous one, Right? It might be denied. Right? Let me answer your question this way. The way you get in trouble is if you build it without seeking permission. Because once you do it by yourself, then you lose it. But if you go to the city and say, hey, we want a variance to you know, build a uh, uh, whatever else, if they grant it to you, that doesn't screw up your previous use. Right? Does that make sense? Good. Well, we're not done with this case yet. So who are we up to? Uh, uh, so Paige, so what, what happens here, right? So the, so the government of this city says, you need to shut down your business in 90 days, uh, bring it up to spec, or move somewhere else. What does the uh, Supreme Court of Pennsylvania do here? Why would they need to compensate? What provision of law would require compensation here? Yeah, and actually, if you notice, they're not talking about the federal constitution. They're talking about the state constitution. Remember, there are state constitutions and federal constitution, right? Both can apply. Um, in many cases, state constitutions provide additional protections above and beyond what the federal constitution requires. So, Travis, does the court hold here that amortization is always going to be unconstitutional? What's the holding here? Um, no, it's based on certain circumstances on a case-by-case basis. Well, is that the majority? What does the majority here say? According to the majority, is amortization ever permissible without compensation? Majority is a bright line rule, right? Majority is a bright line rule. It says you can never have an amortization provision, ever, without providing compensation. That telling someone that to shut down their business is going to always be unconstitutional. 
And they use this phrase, right? They use this phrase, per se confiscatory. Per se confiscatory. William, what the heck does that mean? Per se confiscatory. That means that like, maybe it's not the letter of the law that they're confiscating, but everything that they're doing is not. What's per se mean by itself? I remember from case, case law that's like, I actually give you the answer, you didn't even hear it. I have this awful habit. What does per se mean? Did you even hear it? What does that word mean, per se? The phrase? Rabbit? Essentially, basically, like the effects of everything. Yeah, it basically means, I mean, it's literally by itself, right? By itself. But it, it, it generally means automatically, right? Remember, like, libel per se? That sound familiar? I suppose it's libel per qua. Per se beast means automatically. And confiscatory is like to confiscate, right? It basically means it's an automatic taking, an automatic confiscation. Right? When you see per se, it's <coughs> automatic. So when you have facts like this with amortization, it's automatically taking. There's no balancing, right? There's no looking for factors and weighing this or that. It's going to be a taking. And with the taking, the government has to pay compensation. Okay? That's the majority. The concurring opinion is different. The concurring opinion says it's not per se confiscatory. Right? Christina, according to the concurring opinion, under what circumstances would amortization be appropriate? Okay, good. Now, according to the concurring opinion, what would make a taking, I'm sorry, what would make amortization reasonable? Why would it be reasonable? It Has a judge decide what's reasonable? I know it's a question you, think, you don't probably don't think about, but what makes a what makes something reasonable? What exactly with amortization has to be reasonable, to be precise here? What has to be reasonable? What, what are they measuring here? The time. The time, right? So if 90 days is too short, what would be a reasonable time frame then to wind down a business? Six months. Oh, so 90 days, three months bad, six months good. Mia, what do you think, according to current justice, would be a reasonable time period? I think he says like a couple of years. Now. Couple years. So imagine you go to the business owner and say, "All right, I want you to uh, run your business for three years and shut it down." What do you think the business owner will tell you in response? He'll laugh at you. Yeah. Why would he laugh at you? Because that's ridiculous to ask someone that. But why is it ridiculous? Precise <coughs> here. Well, it's there's a lot of like costs associated with running a business and just making him run it for three years and then shut it down. Credit, right? If you want to buy a piece of property, you're probably going to need a mortgage. Banks usually don't give mortgages to businesses that they shut down in three years, right? <coughs> you want a line of credit saying, look, I need a line of credit uh, for the next three years, and then I won't have any business anymore. <laughs> Will anyone sell you inventory, right? Will anyone like, give you, I mean, this inventory, is, I guess, moves pretty quick, though. But you know, would anyone give you inventory, put in your shelves, if they know your business is shutting down in a few months? Of course not. So the majority is saying, look, these amortization preventions are basically scams, right? No one can run a business under circumstances that um, in three months, six months, two years, whatever it is, you have to shut down. But what's the flip side, right, Taylor? Why does the um, concurring opinion see a lot of value in this amortization provision? Defend it. Go ahead. Defend, defend the amortization rule. Why, why would the city want to have this in their books? Good. What's the what's the alternative? You can't use amortization. What 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 can happen? They want the they want Yes. Right. So if you don't have amortization, things stay the same. The composition of the community stays the same. The stuff that you want to get rid of, because you thought it was bad, will be there forever. Right, think of the uh, the landfill I mentioned in Cincinnati, right? It's been there for decades. The city's grown up, you know, people have residential, 
but you saw this old non-conforming use. So, this, so the concurring opinion is saying cities should have the right to change their character, right? Cities should have the right to define how they look. And if you take majority rule, they can never do it. Well, Blaine, is it true they can never do it? Is it true that the city now can't get rid of this uh, uh, adult bookstore? Is that, is that the case? Um, Let me ask the question a different way. If the city wants to get rid of the adult bookstore, what do they have to do? They can do it. They can get rid of it if they want to. What must they do, though? Emma? They got to pay. Show me the money, right? They have to pay. They have to use the power of eminent domain to condemn the land. And if they condemn the land, they have to pay up. Now, Elaine, I'll come back to you this question. Why would the city not want to use that option, right? Emma's is exactly right. They could pay up. Why would the city not want to do that? Yeah, it's expensive. It's a lot easier for a city to write an amortization clause, which is free, than to actually use the process of condemnation and to seize their property and pay for it. And there might be several bookstores in this neighborhood, and you have to pay up for it, and maybe the city doesn't have it. So amortization is free. They can just pay up and you know take whatever they want, but this approach doesn't. Bradley. So the federal constitution thing Takings clause is got to be for public use, right? That's right. So I'd, I'd imagine it'd be at least similar for the state takings. I mean, it could change. It, it's very similar, yeah. So what would be the public use? Getting rid of pornography stores? And is, is turning into a park? Is there any question of fact whether or not that's. A so you'll study, public yeah. use? you'll study this later as term that people Kilo versus Give Me London. And what the Supreme Court said there is that. Public use basically whatever the government wants it to be. So if they want to condemn a property to make a park, that's good enough. If they want to condemn your property to make an office complex, that's good enough also. So public use imposes no meaningful constraint. Now your question's a good one, right? Who's to say that this adult bookstore is better or worse the community than a park? Maybe the people who in township want to go there and get books and other devices, right? Yeah, yeah. So, but under the federal constitution, the public use language doesn't have much to do. Never mind. You can Did I? Good. I love when that happens. Other questions? Yeah, Bradley. So isn't Kilo like a Pfizer? Thing? That's that's exactly right. Yeah, we'll get there. In a, I think our last day of class on Kilo. Yeah. So what happened was there was a. Um, <coughs> Uh, a bunch of homes in New London, Connecticut, and uh, Pfizer, the big pharmaceutical, said, we want to build a uh, office complex in uh, uh, New London, Connecticut. And so the long story short, the government used the power of eminent domain. They eventually won the Supreme Court. They bulldozed all these homes, and they said, ah, we will have this for Pfizer. And then Pfizer merged with Merck. They said, never mind, we're not interested. Uh, and the lot is still empty a decade later. I, I was there. I was almost got arrested there, but lost. <laughs> So I went there once a couple years ago, and I had my camp. This is a long time ago. I had my camcorder, my video camera, and I was basically driving around the town and taking videos for, for class. And um, uh, I wasn't really paying attention to where I was going. I made a wrong turn, and I pulled into the parking lot of General Dynamics, which is a military contractor. And this idiot with my camera, I'm going like this. Oh, where am I? Where am I? And this this guy, this huge guy in the jeep, pulls in front of me. I'm like, oh man! And he gets us like, what are you doing here? And I'm like, okay, I'm a law professor. I am taking videos for my students. He didn't believe a word I was saying. So he's like, give me your license. I was like, oh, God, I'm being arrested. So I, I, gave, I, I was trespassing. I was, I was literally trespassing and filming on this, on this private land. So I was a property professor, right? Trespassing. So I, I gave the guy my license. <laughs> I gave the guy my license. And I, he was there for a good 10 minutes. He had blocked my car. I couldn't go anywhere. And I'm like, oh, he's going to call the cops. And then the guy came back and said, look, I'll delete all the videos on my camera. I'll even show you. Just let me go. He's like, fine. So I leave the videos. I showed him the camera was clean. Um, he was like, fine. Get out of here. So I got video of other stuff, but not that. I went back and filmed the other areas. But um, my, my, my dedication to all of you, which is appreciated by none, but uh, I, I did drive there and take some pictures. Anyway. So the bottom line of this case is that with amortization, there are two different approaches. There is the majority approach, which is that it's a per se Taking a per se, confisc uh, per se confiscatory, that's always a taking, and you got to pay. 
the concurring opinion is that, well, so long as the amortization provision is reasonable, that is, it's, you know, Goldilocks, right? Not too long, not too short, just right. Then it will pass constitutional scrutiny. Um, I'm not sure that there's a majority minority rule here. It really does vary. Um, but, but you do see that some states' courts use a heightened scrutiny when referring to amortization clauses under their state constitution. Questions on the first case? Questions on the first case? Yeah, I was really scared for five minutes, like, oh, I'm getting arrested. <laughs> Being gooder, this is Josh. <laughs> I a fun phone call. I, actually, when I was a 1L, my torts professor didn't know what the hell he was doing. He, he was from Georgia, and he had a genius idea for a Halloween costume to carry a gun, which would be fine in Georgia, but he went to the District of Columbia, where you couldn't, and he got arrested, he got pulled over, and he actually got busted with a gun in his car, and he actually had to call the dean because he just moved there, didn't know anyone else. That was a, he's not teaching there anymore. Uh, so this, <laughs> that was on my mind, but uh, anyway, happens. Any other questions in the first case? <coughs> in the first case. Okay, so let's see the second topic. Um, the second topic introduces what are called the flexibility, flexibility and zoning. And there are two phrases that I promise you will confuse in the exam. At least 10 of you will mix these up in the exam. Um, it happens every year. No matter how clearly I explain it, you'll still mix them up because they're so similar. And what makes it even more confusing is that people use these words interchangeably when they shouldn't. So I want to be very precise about our terminology. I'll be very precise about our terminology. <clears throat> Okay? And I want you to understand the difference between a variant or a special exception. Okay? A variance and a special exception. Okay? Different terms. Okay. Uh, where am I having to? Well, I think, uh, Bradley, you're next, yes. What is a variance? This seemed like to me like a variance was more of a, it's, it's after the fact, but it's not quite as particular maybe as a special exception. Spec special exception would be more specific um, to the actual person asking it. Well, or probably not a very good definition. Let's try again. Um, under what circumstances would someone seek a variance? Uh, maybe maybe that would be a little more precise. If, if they had... If, if they were conforming and then a new zoning ordinance came out and so then they became non-conforming so they out of undue or hardship um, and reasons for equity they're asking for a variance so that they're, they're they may not be conforming but they can still feel that's like that's very close so Samrita let me ask you a question like this when would someone apply for a variance well, under what circumstances would someone apply for one that's the standard. We'll get there later. But I'm asking you, when would someone apply for a, hard, a, a variance? When they're about to make a material change. For yes, okay. So you apply for a variance when you're going to make a change, right? You're going to apply for a variance when you want to make a change. But can, but can you make the change to read under the normal law? No. Yes. Specifically, the change you want to make is prohibited under the zoning laws of your city, right? You want to make a change, and that change is prohibited. Now, what happens if you just build it anyway, Alex? What if you just decide, screw the zoning board, I'm going to build this big house anyway, what's going to happen to you? <laughs> you, you I don't, yeah, exactly what, what's going to happen if you, don't, if you don't comply with, if you don't seek a variance in the first place? Well, I wasn't in with the zoning law, so I and then what's the court going to order you to do? Conform. Conform. So let's say let's say you decide to build a second story of your house when it says only one story house. And you just say, screw it, I'm going to build it myself with two hands. What happens to you? What are they going to do to you? I don't even know. Well, think about it, right? How can you conform to the zoning ordinance that says one story only? What would you have to actually do? You have to take off the Yes! Take your roof off. Yeah, I'm not joking. If you decide to go ahead 
and build a second story on your house. When the zoning law says only one story, guess what? The court's going to order you to remove the second story. So literally rip the roof off, remove the shingles, and go down one floor. And that's entirely within their power. And if you don't do it, they'll fine you. And the fines are basically per, per day. They may fine you $100 a day, right? After a week or two, that starts adding up pretty quick. So it's not a joke, right? If there's a zoning ordinance and you say, I don't care, I'm gonna build this anyway, right? I'm gonna build my second story. Good luck, they're gonna tear it down for you. And you have to pay attorney's fees. I mean, that's employment for all of you, but, but you know, for, for homeowners, <coughs> it's not a good idea. Yeah, you said. You can do that, right? You can do that. But usually what happens in these cases is you have a person who wants to do something. And like the example I give Alex is very easy, right? The law says one story in the middle of the second story. That's that's easy. But what happens if it's like, you know, you're six inches short, right? Then you need to take 30 feet of frontage in front of your house. And you have like 29 feet six inches. And you're like, oh whatever, who cares? I'm gonna just, you know, build a little bit anyway. 29 feet six inches is not 30. And they can make you tear down the entire house because you missed six inches on the, on the front of the bed. <coughs> so that's why the variance exists, right? You seek the variance before you break ground because once you decide to break ground and build, you're screwed, right? You're in trouble. Don't do it. So Valerie, if someone wants a variance, what do they have to demonstrate to the, um, to the zoning board? Yeah, they have to show an undue hardship. Now tell me, what does that phrase mean, Valerie, undue hardship? It's kind of an equity proven that it is extremely unfair that the only thing that takes exists allows you to not take one. Now, how difficult must a hardship be for it to be undue? Extremely. Very good. So you remember we did the topic of necessity when there's an easement, right? And there's a question of if I need to cross over some guy's land, can I get an applied easement? And there's this I give necessity. And there was necessity, and there was strict necessity, right? The idea is, well, you know, maybe I'll have to uh, get a helicopter or get a boat to go around. Remember that? That's this, right? This is strict necessity. And depending how zoning boards implement it, you need to have an absolute urgency to use this. And Yusuf actually raised a good point, right? What if you could just sell the land to someone else? They can build a one family house there. I'm sorry, one story house there. But what if you're able to buy more land? And that way you get your extra six inches, right? Buy some land from the guy next door to get your six inches. Um, if any of those possibilities are available, you don't get your variance. The undue hardship has to be you are absolutely stuck. And unless they give you this special variance, they give you this variance, you're out of luck. You can't do anything. Okay? But it's not enough just to have the undue hardship, right? Natalie, what else do you have to demonstrate? Um, that you aren't the reason for the hardship. Okay. It's not self-inflicted. Good. It's not, well, that goes to hardship. What else must the har What else must the variance uh, uh, comply with? And the, the the Westwood case explains this. Um, you have to make a reasonable effort to figure out a way around it yourself. That goes to hardship, right? If you if there's a way around it, so it's not a hardship. What's another requirement? Um, the second requirement for variance. It should not go against the public good and intent. Exactly. Okay, so Valerie, what, I'm sorry, Natalie, what's the public good? <laughs> what does that mean? Uh, to maintain the characteristics of whatever the area Exactly, is. right. So even if you're able to show an undue hardship, which is, again, really tough to demonstrate, you have to show that this won't harm the public good, right? That it comports, that it follows the general plan of the community. And as you can probably imagine, this is a very um, fuzzy standard, right? This is not this is not bright line rule here. This is very fuzzy, and there's not an absolutely clear way of knowing what is and is not the public good. Now, the rub here is that. Um, Phil, when you're when you're asking for a variance, who are you asking it from? From the zoning board? Yeah. Now are these judges? No. Are these lawyers? Probably not. Are these people elected? Uh, no. no. 
Who are these people? Uh, probably not quite construction people, but who do you think will be on these boards? Yeah, yeah. Regular, you know, non-lawyers and people in the community who have an interest in uh, zoning, right? And people in the community who have an interest in how the neighborhood looks. Um, so when you're appealing to these people, you're basically appealing to their sense of fairness, and there's not much else to describe it. You're saying, look, this is going to be really tough for me, and if you give me this variance, uh, it won't screw things up, right? It won't make the neighborhood worse. Now, Philip, how much discretion then do these zoning members have on their on their hands? Uh, yeah. And what happens if they issue a ruling that you don't agree with? What's the next step? Uh, we can appeal to to a court. Well, there's several steps. You usually have a zoning board, and you have what's called a zoning board of appeals, which is like an intermediary uh, route. It varies by jurisdiction, but eventually you get yourself into, into court. But not, not federal court, you get yourself into state court, right? And that's what happened here. So Kayla, describe the facts here of the first case, the, um, the, the Westwood zoning case. Sure. So um, this man had a piece of property and he wanted to build a house on it. Good. What, what's what's frontage? By the way, I used that word before. I forgot to define it. What's frontage? Um, the amount of land that you can, like the house to the roadway. Yeah, it's like your front yard, right? The idea is you don't want people's houses right on the street. You want frontage, you know, a front yard where the kids can play and there's a buffer between the noisy street and the house. Now, Kayla, why why is frontage? That's a lovely word. Why is frontage so important? Yeah, nice. So what's the cost of frontage? Well, why, why, why is having a lot of frontage problematic? If you're a homeowner waiting to buy. Keep up, but what else? What do you have to do? What if you have a really big family and you don't really want that big of a lawn? Say you want a bigger house. And yeah. The idea of frontage is it restricts how much you can build. Because the more you need for your front yard, the less you can build for a house. And let's say you don't want a front yard, right? Let's say you want a really big backyard. You want to build a pool. But because you need both a front yard and a backyard, you're not going to space to build your pool now. It controls how you use your land, but it also restricts how much of your own house can be built. Right? So Simone, what happens here? The guy wants to build there's not enough room, right? Does that have enough frontage? What does the court do here? Or what, what does the zoning board do here for you? Get to the court? Um, they say that he can't do it. He can or can't? He can't. He can't, that's and right. Thank and you. The court actually sides with him saying that their reasoning for saying that he can't do it basically they didn't line up with the reason. Very good. So this is a rare case, right, where a court reverses a zoning board. That doesn't happen very often. So here, Simone, what was the reason given by the um, by the zoning board of why why they wouldn't give him the variance? Um, they said that he failed to demonstrate any evidence to establish a hardship. Good. That granting of the variance would substantially impair on the intent and purpose of the zone plan and zoning ordinance of that community. Okay. Now, Chester, do those sound like very persuasive reasons given? By, by the zoning board that just Simone just read a minute ago. No. No. And like, if you gave those reasons in legal writing for paper, what kind of grade would you get? Not good. It's just like you're hitting the rule. But yeah. Sense. Exactly. They're just restating the rule. Everyone's seen that, right? There's no analysis. You know, Iraq, right? There's no A. All they're doing is saying, look, here's our rule. It doesn't meet the rule. Therefore, that's the end. And I think Chester's right. This would be a bad writing score, right? So, again, these aren't lawyers. I'm, I'm not trying to jump on them, but they're just saying, yeah, uh, there's no hardship and it will hurt the public good. I mean, they're, they're literally just reading the two standards they have there. And so, Chester, what does the court stand appeal then? Um, they just remanded it back. Um, yeah. For the decision, so. And what do they say should happen on the remand? Uh, they need to go into the issues. Yeah, they should look at the issues, right? <laughs> the effect of this decision right, is to tell the zoning board you have to do some A, some analysis. You have to actually explain why there is a hardship, or not hardship, one second. You have to explain why there's a hardship or no hardship, right? What exactly is the public good? What, what 
what would be the effect of having this guy's house, which is not perfectly you know, fitting into the, to the zone? Chester? But the same way if they came back and had anything that was quote unquote reasonable, they would win, right? Do you think the homeowner will win in the end? No. No. Why not? Rational basis. Bingo. Rational basis review. So it's very hard for a zoning board to lose. All they have to do is make some stuff up, right? They say, well, you know, all the houses in the neighborhood have a certain feel to them, right? And a certain height and a certain width. And we love the idea of children being able to run across the lawn. And, you know, it's not that much of a hardship. You could build, maybe build a smaller house, or maybe buy some land next door. Right? You can make up a hundred reasons in five seconds why zoning is restricted. So the effect of this decision, the, 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 the Westwood case, or, or I'm sorry, West, Westwood, the Westwood case is you can't make it up, right? Give some reason, doesn't have to be the correct reason, rational basis, give some reason, that's it. So even though this is a temporary victory for the uh, homeowner here, I am, I think Chester's right. I think I'm 100% positive that in the end the guy lost, right? Maybe I'm wrong, who knows, right? But I suspect the guy lost after remand because they made up some reasons that you know were good enough and the court affirmed it. So the bottom line here is if your variance is denied, you're out of luck, right? You're out of luck. Even if you show you actually have a hardship that's undue and you can show that this is not gonna harm the public good, you know, the example I gave you stuff a minute ago, right? Your frontage is six inches short. The frontage has to be 29 feet, sorry, 30 feet. You have 29 feet, six inches, right? Like this. You're short this much. Will anyone ever notice that you have this much less grass? Of course not. The government can say, sorry, we don't see the hardships undue. Buy some more land, build a smaller house, whatever. So the variances are very rarely granted. They just, they, they, they don't happen. Okay, that, that's your rule. If you want a variance and you're pleading for a hardship from the board, uh, your best hope is you have some friends on the board. That may help you more than your actual, I'm serious, I'm serious. Uh, I mean, again, I, I'm not saying this to, you know, to uh, attack members of zoning boards, but they're not lawyers, right? They're not appointed. These are like upstanding people in the community and they're gonna make their judgments. And if you you or your lawyer hack with some people on the zoning board, your case will be more persuasive. That, that's, that, that's how this, these sorts of things work. I mean, you get a judicial review, you get a court to review it, but it's under a very, um, very deferential standard. All right, so any questions on the second case, the Westwood case? Any questions on the, if you notice the case called Commons versus Westwood Zoning, he actually sued the zoning board, right? That's the actual style of the case. That's you have to challenge the denial of the, of the, um, of the variance. You actually sue the zoning uh, commission. All right, any questions on that? Yeah, you so the zoning board and the zoning board of appeals for different people? Generally, yeah. Okay. Yeah, generally they're structured. And, and more likely than not, the board of appeals might have some lawyers on it, but it's not a requirement. Um, we'll do a case, I think, in class next time, which involves where you have the zoning board with a bunch of architects on it. And they have very um, specific visions of what they should look like. And if you think that making your case to a lawyer is tough, right? Imagine making your case to an architect that would be said to please him. That, that's a different story. All right, so any questions on that? The walker? No. No, but you're next. Yes, sir. <laughs> I know you won't raise your hand. That's why you're next. All right. Tell us, how does a variance differ from a special exception? How is a, how is a special exception different? Uh, so if you're applying for a special exception, I'm assuming that, like, so in this case, they wanted to develop some... No, 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 I'm not asking about the case yet. What's the difference between a variance and a special exception in the abstract? Don't have it? Uh, you said. I believe it's when the ordinance is already in place and you, you, uh, you attempt to give an exception before you do something. So, okay. Um, what do you mean the ordinance is in place? You're actually very close. You're on the right track. What does it mean the ordinance is already in place? <coughs> like, it's not that. Um, you did something and then the ordinance came in, the ordinance was in place and you still want to do something, therefore you need to get an exception before you can do this. Well, variance is the same way, right? But the case you just did, the ordinance was already in effect. 
that how how much front did you have to have? It doesn't actually change circumstance, right? So, uh, Thomas, what's the difference between a variance and special exception? Um, is it the circumstances uh, regarding the person trying to change? Like, for instance, in the variance, the lot size is just too small. There's literally no way that he could comply without breaking the ordinance. Uh -huh. And the special exception, um, could it be, you know, you know you're going to break the rule, and you don't have to break the rule, but you're applying, like, I don't know. Same tag, uh, I forgot. Yeah. Um, the special exception is a lower standard than the variances because you're not trying to prove an undue hardship. You're more saying that what I want to do is not um, going to cause any kind of harm, per se. It's a little, it's a slider, slider standard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, for the variance, uh, the administrator authorized. Uh, from the same Okay. Uh, the exception is permitted by the ordinance, uh, but it's you're not. It's not an exception to the. It's, it's not necessarily incompatible with the ordinance. Right. Well, let's try this. Um, uh, Lauren, let me ask you this question, Lauren. You're up at least three. Okay, so get ready. Sorry, y'all. Uh, okay. You're already throwing the Virginia into the bus. Fine, fine, fine. Robert, um, when, with, the, with the variance, let me ask you this important question, right? <laughs> with the variance, who is making the tough decision about whether or not they're granted? The, so, the zoning board gets a lot of deference in, as opposed to the right. exception. So, how does, where does the zoning board get the authority to either grant or deny? Where do they get that power from? Um, well, for a for a special exception, it's the legislature. No, 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 no. It's a variance. So for the variance, they, they, they get a lot of they get a lot. Of no, I, you're giving me deference. That's what court said. I'm asking yeah. the first instance. Where does the zoning board get the authority from? The city. The city. Ah, and where does the city get that authority from? From uh, the city legislature, I suppose. Okay, very good. So we discussed the police power, right? <laughs> The police power belongs not to the city, but to the state, right? The city of Houston is irrelevant. If tomorrow Texas wants to eliminate the city of Houston, they can do that in a heartbeat, right? There's no reason why Houston must exist. Houston has no police power but for what the state gives it. And Texas and all states in the union have enacted these zoning enabling acts, these enabling acts. And the effect of an enabling act is to give to a city the power to zone. Now, when the city writes its zoning code, they then give some authority to the zoning board. They say, hey, zoning board, we give you the power to grant variances. And we tell you, you can grant a variance in extreme circumstances, right? Circumstances we can't predict, where there's a hardship that's undue, and it serves the public good, right? The point of a variance is the city says, we don't know all the various hardships that may arise, we want to give the zoning board the flexibility to issue a variance where it is required. Everyone understand that? The special exception is different. While the variance is for unpredictable things, the special exception is for predictable things, right? The special exception is for circumstances that they know are going to arise, right? They know that occasionally people will ask to uh, uh, build an apartment in a, in a residential area. <clears throat> and they say, well, as a general matter, you can't do that unless you do X, Y, and Z, right? If you do X, Y, and Z, then you get your permit. The difference between the variance and the special exception is with a variance, it's for unpredictable circumstances. For the special exception, the government says, we know exactly this is going to happen, and if you do X, Y, and Z, you get it. So the real difference, though, is discretion, right? With a variance, they basically have unlimited discretion of whether to grant it or deny it. 
the idea of a hardship is very personal, and the people on the board have a lot of latitude. However, for a special exception, they don't have that much discretion. They can only apply the factors given by the legislature. Don't forget, the zoning board is not a lawmaking body. The, law, the, the, the lawmaking body is the state legislature or the city council. The zoning board, they're not lawyers, they're not elected. All they can do with special exception is mechanically apply these factors. Right? Is there 60 feet? Yes. Is the paint color blue? Yes. Okay, you get your special exception, right? It's got to be fairly mechanical thing. The problem with the next case, right, the, 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 the case from Maine, the Coke case, is that the standards given in the exception were very vague, very general. <clears throat> Do you remember a concept in constitutional law called the non-delegation doctrine? Does that ring a bell? This is not just in federal, the answer is yes. This is not just a concept in federal constitutional law, but in state constitutional law as well. The legislative branch cannot give away its lawmaking powers. That's what the non-delegation doctrine says. The legislative branch cannot give away its lawmaking powers. That's not just to the president. They even apply to something as mundane as a zoning board. The city council can't give the power to make laws to the zoning board. All they can do is let them apply specific factors. And that was the issue in the very first case, right? The Coke case. So, I say, you're the next person thrown under the bus. What, uh, <laughs> what, what were the facts here? The petitioner wants to build a multi-unit apartment building. There's an ordinance prohibiting that. He requests an exception in order to be able to do it. Okay. So they wanted to build an uh, apartment complex in a residential area. Now, was this some sort of unpredictable circumstance that would never no one ever know could happen? Yeah. The city was aware this could happen, right? Yeah. So what were the four factors, the four criteria, I say, that the city put up to uh, consider whether to grant these uh, special exceptions? The first would be if the other requirements of the ordinance were met. Very good. The use will not adversely affect the health, safety, morals of the public. Good. The use will not tend to defeat the purpose of the ordinance. Good. And the use will not tend to devaluate or alter the essential characteristics of the surrounding property. Okay, very good. Now, Virginia, how precise are these factors, particularly number two and four? Very big. They're very big, right? How, uh, Virginia, what does it mean that it won't affect the welfare of the community? I don't know. What does that mean? I mean, that could be anything. Right? And what about this last one? It won't alter the character of the neighborhood. Um, again, it could be anything. So, okay, good. So, Lauren, can phone you now? Yes. <laughs> ready. You're ready, right? You're ready to roll. Lauren, what's problematic then about the zoning board making these sorts of decisions about what it means to promote the welfare or to. Um, uh, alter the character. Why is that problematic? Because it goes back to what you said. They're not lawyers, and so they can't make the determination. Not just lawyers. Question. You don't have to be a lawyer to be a legislature. What, what are they not? What, 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 do they, what are these zoning board people not? It doesn't matter if they're legal or not. That's not, that's not the big issue. Well, they can't make the determination of whether these... Why are... can't they? What are they not? Not lawyers. Judges? No, not judges. Which branch is responsible for doing this? Which branch of government? Legislature. Yes! Going. Good. Oh, okay, so they're not legislators to make, the, make out of what would require them to not be exactly violation. Exactly right. It took a little thing. Yeah, exactly right. I appreciate the delay in getting four people to you, but you got there eventually. <laughs> the issue here is this, right? The issue here is this. These are not legislatures. They're zoning board members, not elected, they're appointed. And they don't have the lawmaking power to decide. What is in the welfare of the community? They don't have the power to decide what alters the character of the neighborhood. With respect to special exceptions, all they can do is mechanically apply factors, right? So number one is fine. I think actually number three is problematic also. What does it mean to plan? That's pretty open-ended. But um, the problem here is that these, uh, uh, these special exception conditions are too broad. And they actually amount to an unconstitutional delegation of the legislative power to the zoning board. 
Okay? Now, Justin, isn't deciding, we did this before, is deciding what a hardship, isn't that very vague? Isn't that, isn't that really vague? Yeah. Why is that not unconstitutional? Why can, why can zoning boards grant variances but not grant this sort of special exception? Does that have to do with them not being limited by the standards of the legislature? Uh, well, the standard is undue hardship, right? That's what the standard is. That's, man, that's actually vague. Why is that? Why can the, why does the court say you can grant a variance and not the special exception? Why? why? I'm not sure of the difference. Elena? Does it do not limit the conditional use of the zoning ordinance? Well, conditional use is a synonym for special exception. Yeah, let me. Um, you'll see special exceptions. You also see what's called. Uh, a conditional use permit. They're, 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 they're synonyms. But what's the difference? Right, Elena? What's the difference between a variance and a special exception? Why can you have a very nebulous standard of new hardship, but you can't have a special exception like the one in this case? Come on. You're getting close, you're getting close. Lindsay, you want to take a step? No idea. No idea? Uh, not that in call already. That's it? It's because like what you said before, uh, for special exceptions, they need that legislative authority in order for them to make that decision. But here, the board lacks that power. Close, close, Robert. I was going to say, it's, a, it's the fact that non-delegation doctrine that you talked about at the beginning of it. But why, why, why can they delegate the power to determine hardships? Isn't that a non-delegation problem? It's a, uh, it creates this quasi-judicial power. Quasi-judicial, so we're yeah. executor. Good. Yeah, they're not supposed to, they're not supposed to write laws, but when you have these quasi uh, uh, factors, then they're really putting their own spin on it. Yeah, Valerie. Um, so the violence feels like doesn't That's the answer. And special exceptions are? That's, that's the right answer, very good. The court explains, right? The difference is a variance is unpredictable, right? The legislature can't delegate in advance specific guidelines for unpredictable things, right? The legislature can't draft a statute for every conceivable problem. So they're basically forced to give this, this sort of open-ended blank check authority for finding a hardship. In contrast here, when they're specifically legislating on known events for known things, there's a higher burden and a higher standard. So that's the answer, right? The court addresses this. With variances, you can have these sorts of open-ended standards because it's unpredictable. But with a special exception, it is predictable. And you need to have more precision. You need to have precise standards. As a result, the statute here is unconstitutional on its face, and the court granted a uh, permit for the exception. Questions on this case, on the, uh, on the Coke case? Questions? Questions done? And okay, we'll get the difference between a special exception and variance. I'm going to test for this, I promise. Um, don't mix them up. I promise. If I ask you about a special exception and you start talking about hardship, you're wrong. Right? If I ask you about a variance and you start giving me various factors, you're wrong. So make sure you get the right test. Just don't screw it up. Again, if you get the, the vocabulary right, you're basically halfway to a B. Right? You're almost there. Get the terminology right and you're almost to a B. <coughs> Let's do the last case. Um, the last case involves something called spot zoning. All right, Lindsay, you want to try that one? What's spot zoning? Um, I, don't, I don't know. 
Latin that had very slight value changes to help limit the small plots of land was established and used classification and consistent with surrounding uses to create an island of non-conforming use within a larger zone district. That's exactly right. <laughs> that, that's exactly right. The answer is looking for it. Spot zoning is exactly what Lucy just said. It's where you create a special um, island. I think it's where she is, right? You create a special island where the zoning laws are different than anything else, right? So maybe in the entire community, you have a rule that says only one family homes. And then on a single block, you have a separate rule that says, ah, but on this block, you're allowed to have a high rise condominium. Right, so Megan, what's problematic about these sort of spot zoning rules? Why, why would that potentially be problematic? It's just not fair. Not fair to whom? To the people that are restricted by the zoning law. Megan, who will usually complain about spot zoning? Other developers? Who do you think will probably, at least in, this, in the first case, right? Who will usually complain about these sorts of uh, spot zoning rules? The neighbors, right? The neighbors are the ones who are upset. And think about it like this. If you buy a house in a community and the zoning law says only one family homes, and you live there, you're happy. And then all of a sudden, like in this case, you have uh, the Mayo Clinic wants some housing built nearby in Rochester, Minnesota. And they talk to their friends in the zoning board and say, of course, we will pass a new zoning ordinance just for you, all right? Just for you. And we'll let you build a high density uh, 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 luxury condominium, all right, Anthony? Why would the neighbors not be happy about that? They said that it was gonna impose in their neighborhood, change the aesthetic and the characteristics. Right, so Anthony, let me ask the question like this. Did the um, did the developers here request a variance? No. Did they request a special exception? In a way, it was the, it was the well, well, no, no. Did, was there a statute that they tried to comply with with X, Y, Z factors? No. What did they do here? They they basically moved the zone in a little ha, bit. Ha, how 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 they move it? Right? How that happen? What 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 had to happen for that to work? They had to show that it wasn't going to be. What was the process by which they got that? Through the board. And what did they ask the board to actually do? Were they asking for a variance or special exception? It's always discussed so far. No. What did they ask for? For it to be rezoned. They changed the law, right? That's permanent. They were not asking for a variance, which again requires a hardship. <coughs> uh, is that Robert? Yes. Robert, oh, yeah, that's fine, that, that's fine for now. Robert, could they have shown an undue hardship to the reason why they have a luxury condominium place in this neighborhood? Is there any conceivable plan where they would have showed a hardship? Um, I'm sorry, where the developers would have to Yeah, could the, could the developers show a hardship of why they need to build luxury condos? What do you think? I think they could come up with one, but I mean... Do you think it'd be undue hardship? No. no. Was there any statute on the books about how they could have gotten a, a special exception? I don't think there was. There was not. So what what was your only option, right? What did they actually have to end up doing? Rezone that land. For lobby. Oh. Right? They had to lobby. And they had to ask the zoning board of Rochester, Minnesota, which is where the Mayo Clinic is located, for a change in zoning laws. And uh, oh okay. All the way around. Good job today. Christine. What was the um <laughs> I can, the case I can do the full class, it's good. Christine, what 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 happened during the zoning board meeting? What was going on there? Killing me almost there, Matt. You mean after? So after the neighbors appealed. Yeah. And then the court, the, and then the board. Well, what, according to the minutes, what was actually <coughs> discussed during the zoning board meeting? Uh, that basically that, that the if they were allowed to build the the condominium plate, that it would conform with the the. The public use already around it that it would be good for the city. Were well. there any specific findings or reasons given to uh, push the zoning through? Uh, I don't think so. No, you're right. It just conformed with they had a rational basis to allow. Yeah, it. I mean, so that's exactly what happened here. There was no actual reason given during the meeting of why this has to be done. 
you can imagine what's going on. You have the Mayo Clinic, which is this huge healthcare facility. You have a lot of doctors who live there, right? A lot of patients live there. It's like, wow, it'd be nice to have luxury condos a few blocks away from the hospital. And that was probably it. I, I, I'm not there, I don't know what happened. That was probably the nature of the meeting. So, David, what does then the Minnesota court do here? What do they do with the spot zoning? Well, they rejected the argument that it was invalid. The, well, try to have that double negative. Did the court, <laughs> did the court invalidate the spot zoning? Did the court invalidate the spot zoning? What was the holding here? What was the holding of the case? Keep the chart like that. What did the Minnesota Supreme Court do here? That it didn't require that the zoning ordinance be consistent with the land use? What's the holding of the case? The short case, what's the holding? They found that the plaintiffs had the burden of determining or at least arguing that the welfare of the community was at risk by allowing these condominiums to go up. Right. What kind of scrutiny did the uh, Minnesota Supreme Court afford to this uh, zoning law? Rational basis. They gave, and what does rational basis for you mean here? Just basically any good idea works. <laughs> like if, right. it, if it makes sense, then it's fine. Right. So under rational basis review, and it's the same in con law that's here, the plaintiff that is the neighbors, bear the burden of showing that this law has no relationship to health, safety, and welfare. No relationship whatsoever to health, safety, and welfare. Amy, can this ever be demonstrated that there's no relationship to health, safety, and welfare? Can you ever actually beat the rational basis test? Not really. Not really. Yeah, you're right. No, you can't. Why not? Why not? Um, I mean, it's easy to yeah, and, and, the, and the difficulty of litigating against the rational basis test is the court can make up reasons after the fact, right? So imagine, imagine you're a lawyer, right? You've submitted all of your briefs. You've made your arguments. You've addressed every single position advanced by the government. And then after the briefs are submitted, arguments are done, the court makes up a fifth reason, which you had to consider before. Ah, it's not. The plaintiff didn't address this other reason which we just made up. Welcome to the rational basis. That's how you litigate it, right? It's a very... The very thing is like you know, move, you know, if you're, if you're like football, right? The goalposts keep moving around, or if you know, if you're, uh, uh, you know, baseball, right? The infield keeps going in and out depending who's at bat. It's it's very difficult to, uh, uh, to to litigate that. But but you're right. The court holds that we're not going to scrutinize the spot zoning, and even though it's obviously done to just one party, one party alone, that possessed a rational basis, and the court did not invalidate it. So questions on the uh, the Minnesota case. All right, so let me summarize a bit. So the, um, uh, uh, the readings for today should convey a message to you. Um, and the message is this, that zoning boards get a lot of deference when they make their decisions. <clears throat> so unless you have something that actually deprives you of the value of your land, whether it's a physical taking or an amortization clause or perhaps a regulatory taking, which we'll study in a week or so, the answer to your question we let off with is false, right? Generally speaking, when the government operates under the police power, they are not going to provide you compensation. And even if the value of your property is diminished significantly, you are out of luck. And courts don't do much to scrutinize the decisions made by the zoning board. Any questions? I will see you on Thursday. Thank you.